Good day, everybody, and welcome to another edition of the Military and Foreign Affairs Network. I am your host, the voice of reason. Today, we're continuing our ongoing coverage of the war between the Russian Federation and Ukraine. So again, welcome to the program. It's uh, good to be here today, as it is almost every day. So, <clears throat> as the war continues... We are continuing to get intelligence in terms of casualties, casualties per, for both sides, how the war is evolving, what is happening on the ground, what is happening in the air, what is happening uh, in terms of the economic situation of the conflict. And we can tell you right now the economic situation for the Ukrainian state is incredibly dire. Now look, two years ago, going into this war, many people in the West believed that these economic sanctions placed on Russia by certain Western nation-states, including the United States, would cripple would cripple the Russian economy. That hasn't happened. The Russian economy is still relatively very strong. In terms of national debt, it is in much better shape than the United States. Much better shape. If you go into a Russian grocery store. Prices are very reasonable. The shelves of the grocery stores are fully stocked. Russians are not going hungry. The quality of life for most Russians is essentially the same as when the conflict started. Now, what's happening for the Ukrainians? It's a lot different. Quite a bit different. So recently, within the last week, the president of Ukraine, Volodymyr Zelensky, while he was uh, attending the uh, globalist meeting in Davos, Switzerland, again, one of the reasons why, why this war is occurring, you can trace those fingerprints all the way back to 2014 to those globalists in Davos. Absolutely. Now, at Davos, Zelensky met with a very important American. Was it a head of state? Was it the, uh, a, a head of the Defense Department? No, he's in a hospital. Was it the head of an intelligence agency? No, it wasn't. He met with the head of a U.S. financial corporation. He met with an individual named Jamie Dimon. And I think most of you who watched the program, know who Jamie Dimon is. He heads up uh, J.P. Morgan. Now, during that meeting, we believe here at Military and Foreign Affairs Network that certain intel was given to Jamie Dimon. And believe it or not, during a recent news interview, we believe Jamie Dimon, through the slip of a tongue, divulged that information. So, Zelensky, in meeting with Jamie Dimon, is, was essentially begging for cash. The Ukrainian state needs hard currency. The only way it can field its military 
and continue military operations is with direct infusions of cash from Western nation state to include large corporations such as J.P. Morgan. Just to note, uh, Jamie Dimon was wearing a Ukrainian flag in a recent news interview as a lapel button. Instead of the U.S. flag, Mr. Dimon had a Ukrainian flag. Now, during this meeting between Volodymyr Zelensky and Jamie Dimon, we believe Zelensky, in pleading for infusions of cash, gave Mr. Dimon information about the current casualty numbers of the Ukrainian military. In a recent news interview, Jamie Dimon, after speaking about his sit-down with Zelensky, stated that the Ukrainians had suffered 300,000 casualties. Now, is that what Mr. Diamond was referring to when he said there were 300,000 casualties in Ukraine? Possibly. Very possible. Is it, is it likely that the Ukrainians have suffered up to 300,000 casualties over the past two years? Very possible. We've heard a variety of numbers. No one has a firm number in terms of Ukrainian casualties. But we suspect because of the continued decrease in morale of the Ukrainian military that those casualty figures of 300,000 that is both dead and wounded may not be far from the truth. Some even believe that Ukrainian casualties exceed that 300,000 number. So again, if we look at the morale of the Ukrainian military, it is at a all-time low. We also believe that the overall uh, numbers of Ukrainian manpower has significantly fallen from its peak of about 1.2 million personnel. Uh, at the start of the war, the, the Ukrainian military was inundated with hundreds of thousands of volunteers. At the same time, the Ukrainian state instituted mass conscription as well. So six months to one year into the war, morale was relatively good, and the Ukrainian military hit about 1.2 million. Now that has fallen dramatically. Part of that is caused by desertion, the unwillingness of new Ukrainians coming to fighting age. Look, kids that were 16, 17 years old at the start of the conflict are now considered fighting age males. Children at the start of the conflict are now considered fighting age males that can be drafted. Many of those children that are now fighting age males do not want to go to the front. And the reason they don't want to go to the front is the high casualty rates. Now, what is that number in terms of uh, Ukrainian fighting strength right now? We believe that number is probably in the neighborhood of five to 700,000 personnel that the Ukrainians have on the front. The Russians, on the other hand, we know that approximately 600 to 650,000 Russians are in the theater of operations. Now, that does not mean that all 600 plus thousand of these Russian troops are inside of Ukraine. They are both in the Ukraine 
and very close to Ukraine serving in some capacity uh, in the war against the Ukrainians. Now, <clears throat> it is reported that the Russians are receiving up to 1,000 to 1,500 volunteers reporting to recruiting stations all across the, the Russian Federation per day. It's very lucrative to join the Russian military right now as a volunteer. You can make quite a bit of money. And that's why we don't see mass mobilization taking place in terms of conscription taking place in Russia. Right now, the vast majority of Russian fighting males reporting to duty are in fact volunteers. And one of the big reasons is the amount of money you can make. Now, the Ukrainians, on the other hand, it's just the opposite. Most of the Ukrainians now being quote-unquote pressed into service are conscripts. The Ukrainian state does not have the finances to offer the same amount of cash bonuses and cash money that the Russians can. Even uh, foreign mercenaries, uh, U.S. former uh, fighting personnel who were in the U.S. military who have volunteered to go over to Ukraine and fight, those that have been discharged from service for whatever reason have claimed that they are often not paid. So many of these Western mercenaries that entered Ukraine thinking that they would be paid something, in fact weren't. And the reason for that is the economic situation with Ukraine. They just don't have the money. As tensions escalate and the war continues between Israel, Hamas, we see tensions in the Red Sea with the Houthis in the United States. We see tensions between Iran and the United States. Iran, which is a major oil producer, as we see these tensions escalate, that only helps the Russians. It increases the price of oil. And it helps the Russian economy. <clears throat> so very interesting to see that meeting between Jamie Dimon and Volodymyr Zelensky. Very interesting to see that release of information in which Jamie Dimon states 300,000 casualties. And when he said 300,000, he was referring to Ukraine. Now, there is talk, there is talk that in the coming months, most likely in deep summer, August, September, that the Russians could be preparing for another large-scale offensive. Look, right now, and over the past few months, the Russians have been dedicated to destroying the Ukrainian military through the use of its air force, through the use of its long-range artillery, multiple launch rocket systems, and drones. The Russian defense budget, this is a very important fact that I'm getting ready to talk about. In 2024, is going to expand to, to 140 billion dollars, U.S. dollars. So just to compare and contrast, in 2021, the Russians were spending between 40 and 60 billion, depending on how you, you look at things, on 
the Russian military. A year into the conflict, the uh, defense budget had increased, the Russian defense budget had increased to uh, $80 billion. And going into 2024, it's estimated that the Russians are going to spend over $140 billion, possibly as high as $180 billion. That's about 5 to 6% of the uh, Russian gross domestic product, GDP. That is going to be interesting to see what happens with that kind of spending. The Ukrainians cannot even come close to matching what the Russians are spending. Not even close. Again, the Ukrainians are relying on the United States, the French, Western Europe to provide it with cash. The Russians have the cash. They have oil. Now, what is the Russian military going to look like in another year to two years. We, we continuously look at that 2025 time frame in which we believe we could see possibly enhanced and peak Russian capability. We're going to see tremendous growth in the Russian military this year. And a lot of that has to do with the amount of money in the Russian defense budget. And not just in terms of personnel, not just in terms of the sheer size of the Russian military, but new equipment, new systems. We've already seen the Russians fielding new cruise missiles, air-launched cruise missiles, sea-launched cruise missiles, ground-launched missiles that are much more enhanced than what we saw at the start of the conflict. They have active protection systems. They have active electronic warfare systems on those cruise missiles. We didn't see that at the start of the conflict. We're seeing new drones. I anticipate we will start to see uh, the Russians field much more advanced drone systems. I believe that a lot of these systems are going to originate from Chinese manufacturing. Chinese systems that currently exist are in development. I think we will see that technology being handed over to the Russians, and then ultimately the Russians producing some of those same systems the Chinese are producing right now. And the Chinese are producing some very advanced drone systems as we speak. Not just kamikaze drones. These are direct attack systems that re- release precision-guided munitions. We're seeing new Russian bombs. We're seeing new Russian cruise missiles coming online. And one of the main reasons for that is this massive defense budget that the Russians are spending on. So it was interesting to see the Jamie Dimon interview, especially him talk about Ukraine. You can, you can definitely see where, <laughs> where uh, uh, Mr. Dimon's support lies, and uh, we'll see if that continues. Uh, obviously, if it has to do with money and the spending Uh, especially in terms of large U.S. uh, defense uh, subcontractors and defense contractors, uh, there's money to be made. And in closing, if you are going to invest in one defense stock, one defense stock globally, what would that be? Love to hear it. All right, so that's it. I've uh, rambled on quite long today. Again, pleasure to be here. We'll see you in the comments section. Have a good day.